Hi everybody, it's Christy and welcome to a very special edition of An Atheist Ass. I'm here today with Dr. Stephen Cattell. Dr. Cattell is an associate professor uh, with the Department of Politics and International Studies at Warwick University. His main research interests are the politics of secularization, non-religion, and the role of religion in public life. His most recent publication appeared in the August 2015 edition issue of the Polit of Pol Political Studies entitled The Militant Strain and Analysis of Anti-Secular Discourse in Britain, but he is here today to talk with me and you about an earlier paper called Divided We Stand, The Politics of the Atheist Movement in the United States, which appeared in the Journal of Contemporary Religion in 2014. So Dr. Cattell, Stephen, Thank you so Hello. much for coming on. Yeah, thank you for having me. How are you? Are you all right? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for asking. And uh, I should say that um, this is now a follow on from your, I recorded you at the Political Studies Association in the spring of this year giving a talk. And you were very kind to let me put that up on my channel and to share that with my subscribers. And I'm very excited about this opportunity to talk more about your research and your research agenda because I think this is an important topic that really is under-researched in the social sciences. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree, it's completely under-researched. There are a few people now, uh, suddenly over the, what would it be, maybe the, the last sort of five or six years, starting to research this in more detail, but it's still one of those areas that you know, much more needs to be done. I don't want to carry on with this point because I know it's one of them you're going to come on to, but yeah, definitely under-researched. Yeah, great. So, oh, um, yes, thank you for coming on today. And before we start talking about the article, why don't you tell us uh, maybe a little bit about how you became interested in the topic of religion or, say, non-religious belief yeah. and politics? Okay. Um, it's a slightly convoluted path, actually. I started off um, just doing mainstream British politics uh, was, was the thing I was into. Uh, and then the Iraq war happened. And that became a, a thing. And so I started to become interested in sort of foreign policy stuff. And then after a while, you sort of get a bit, um, bored's not the right word, but you, you start to realize that your, your ability to kind of shape things and influence stuff is quite limited when you're talking about British politics. And I started to gravitate towards the whole religion side of things because I became interested in um, the new atheism with Richard Dawkins and uh, et al. Uh, and so that was just uh, starting to take off at the time, and that was really interesting to me. And it, it sort of occurred to me that it was in the 20th century, it had been things like fascism, for example, and then the Cold War, the big ideological struggles, they'd, they'd kind of framed and dominated uh, that century. And that religion was going to be one of the big dividing lines of the 21st century. And so therefore, you know, we need to start looking at this stuff. And then as I sort of got into it, realized that political science in particular really wasn't doing very much in terms of looking at politics and religion and then within that non-religion is just you know even, even more sort of marginalized so that was the route I kind of took into it it wasn't a straightforward you know from the very beginning we start off doing politics and religion it was a very kind of circuitous way into it as it were yeah, and did I see at academia.edu that you had some paper up about, is it, do we need something like a, a certain perspective of religion and political science or something? Yeah, yeah. So there was a, a piece of research which was looking at whether or not we needed to have, you know, there's this thing where you have the sociology of religion uh, and then you have all the philosophy of religion and the history of religion and, and so on and so on, right? But the only one that really doesn't have one is the political science. Uh, so it's just an obvious question. Should political science be looking at religion? Well, clearly it should because religion is, is just political in so many ways. And it, it's sort of, it's so obvious that religion is political. It, it seems absurd to sit here and, and sort of list all the reasons, right? It just, it obviously is, and you know that your, your sort of day-to-day -day life. Um, so it's clearly political. And, but the odd thing is that political science, which is the social science discipline that claims to be able to explain political phenomena, doesn't really engage with religion at all. Um, and I, I sort of found that to be odd, really. Um, I'm not claiming that nobody in political science does religion or has ever done religion, because clearly they have, but in terms of the mainstream of the discipline, it's very, very marginalised. Um, I did another study, this is a really boring study, so I wouldn't advise anybody to read it, because there's lots and lots of statistics in there, right, which was looking at the extent to which political science had ignored religion. And I took the top 20, you know, however you, manage, uh, you work that out, top 20 political science journals, and I looked at every single thing they'd published in laborious, tedious detail, 
for a sort of 10 year period from the, the turn of the century and then tried to categorize how much of that had been related to religion. And I can't remember the exact statistic, but it was something like two and a half percent of all their articles had anything to do with religion at all over the entirety of that 10 year thing, which just seems weird to me, given what we know about religion and how influential it is. And in fact, one of my um, favorite statistics from that particular study right, was there's a journal called the American Review of Political Science, which is, you know, you'll, you'll know it, right? The, mm -hmm. the number one, widely regarded as the number one journal in political science. And they had more articles on the working of the US Supreme Court in that 10 year period than they did about religion. Just for me, kind of sums it up, right? So there's, there's much more that needs to be done on this. As to whether or not we need a, a political science on religion, I kind of um, I don't go along with that because I think once you start going down that route, you end up with um, erecting more disciplinary boundaries, you know, and you get more localized and parochial kind of perspectives and concerns. And it, it becomes a bit like intellectual uh, imperialism. And so, you know, this territory is for the sociologists and this territory is for the political scientists and everyone else keep up. What I think we should be doing is just having a general science of religion and non-religion. And everybody chip in with what they can and, and use the methods and the techniques that they can to try to stir this big pot and keep the whole thing going rather than trying to split it off into their own separate domains. Yeah, that's, uh, I think, a really good point. And I'm so glad that I asked that question. Uh, and on to my next question, why is it important that we study these social phenomena, the sort of, you know, the role of religion or non-religion? And do you think that the findings that, that social scientists are producing are trustworthy? Mm. Um, why is it important to study religion and non-religious phenomena? God, that's a huge question, isn't it? Um, on one level, it's, it's important and interesting for its own particular area so for example if you're looking at um the politics of non-religion in the united states right that's just obviously an interesting thing in and of itself it's interesting for what it tells you about the culture and the politics of the united states so there's that, that particular thing it's also interesting because you know you can kind of pull the camera right back right and so religion has obviously shaped human society since we crawled out of the caves, right? And however far back you want to go, whether it's 100,000 years or depending on your estimates, quarter of a million years that we've been here on this planet, and religion has shaped it completely. And you don't get, which is one of the other interesting things about atheism, right? You don't get atheism really until the ancient Greeks, which is only a few thousand years ago. And so there's an entire swathe of human history that it just doesn't exist. I mean, I'm sure it must happen somewhere, but we don't know of it, right? And so there's an obvious, interesting dynamic there, which is what gives rise to atheism? What are the conditions under which atheism emerges in the first place? What does this tell us about our evolution as a human species, about our philosophy and our art and our, our cognitive ways of engaging with reality? And so when you start asking questions about atheism, it immediately kind of opens up into this, you know, this vast sort of hinterland of all these other kinds of questions. So it really becomes a sort of never ending panoply of, of questions about the human species. So I'm afraid when you ask a question of why is it important to study atheism? This is, this is one of the reasons because it feeds into all these other areas. Um, one of the things that I find really interesting about looking at uh, religion is this um, field of research you're probably aware of it yourself, right? The cognitive science of mm. religion, which is about the way in which the brain is hardwired to produce. It sometimes gets referred to as the brain has a kind of God module in it, or there's like a God center of the brain. Yeah, like, like it's default to believe. Yeah, so the brain just makes God. It's not quite like that. Um, it's the brain makes things that can be put together in various ways that can make religion. It's a bit slightly, you know, several removes. Um, but that as well, right? So. That gives rise to the question, well, if the brain is kind of hardwired in various ways to make these things, then where do atheists come from? Where do atheists fit into all of this? How does that work? So even on the, you know, kind of going past the politics of it into the realm of human psychology and biology, it touches on all those issues as well. Um, is it, can we rely on, <laughs> on this research? Um, well, yes and no. Um, I mean, some of the things here, a lot of it's qualitative right so therefore it's necessarily open to interpretation and it depends on the 
if you're doing ethnographic research, for example, and you're kind of asking atheists questions, uh, then it depends on the kind of subgroups of atheists that you can get access to. And they may be, so, so for example, um, there's a really good book called Atheists by uh, Altmeyer and Hunsberger, and they produce a great, you know, a huge wealth of, of information about American atheists, right? And this is, this is one of the first books to be published on atheism that kind of gave us this sort of information. But there are great pains to point out during the course of this book that this information comes from a very specific subset of self-identified atheists in one particular part of the country. And so your ability to kind of generalize from all of this is necessarily limited. Um, so can we rely on it? Um, well, yes and no <laughs> is the answer. Um, I'd like to think we can because human beings are quite similar in lots of respects, but by the same token, you know, as a, as a social scientist, we always have to kind of put our critical hat on and be wary of the limitations of, of what we're trying to do. Yeah, most certainly, whether that's survey data and margins of error or mm -hmm. qualitative research and understanding you can't generalize beyond you know, the data that you have. Yeah. I think having a, a cautious, um, basically a commitment to the scientific method as much as possible, or at least mirroring transparency, reliability, validity within our research process, mm -hmm. and then being open and honest about the limitations and also the strengths of our approaches to the data uh, that we um, have available to use. Mm -hmm. really. one, of the, one of the problems with this as well is getting the empirical data, right? A lot of it's really sketchy. Um, because a lot of countries around the world don't measure, they don't measure religion, they, don't, they particularly don't measure non-religion, right? So try, just trying to get the raw material to work with is, is very problematic. Um, but what are you going to do, right? Are you, are you just going to give up? and <laughs> sort of Forget it, let's go down the pub and we'll just ignore the whole thing. Or do you, you kind of acknowledge these limitations and these problems and you just have to make the best with what you've got, right? I would certainly agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> One of the other things, incidentally, you we because we were talking about this before the you know you went on air, right? And you were talking about the social sciences and to what extent they can be scientific and it, how this fits into this particular topic. And one of the things that um, annoys me uh, when some people talk about the social sciences is that it has a bit of a reputation or, or a perspective that it's kind of soft, right? Or a bit woolly and a bit fluffy and it's kind of the hard sciences of physics and chemistry and maths and those sorts of things. That's where, you know, the proper technical minds go and we just kind of do the easy fluffy stuff and we do a bit of qualitative research and we kind of write some conclusions and, you know, we can't generalize from this and so what, what does it mean? Um, I think there's a very good argument though to say that because of this and because it's so fuzzy and difficult to get your head around and to conceptualize and exactly where the parameters of all this stuff is it's tricky to do right there is a good argument to say that we do the hard stuff actually it's the chemists and the people who do physics they anyone can send a rocket into space and land on a comet and <laughs> measure this stuff obviously you've got to have quite a lot of technical know-how but the results are going to be you know it, you will measure the composition of the comet and that will tell you what it is right there's not much conceptualization going on about what the composition of the soil is it's it's, it's black and white right so in, in our line of work although we don't get the same quality of results there is a very good argument to say that our, our stuff is more tricky to do <laughs> i would yeah that's certainly what, agree yeah I mean, con concepts and the flexibility of concepts concepts yeah. travel over time they travel over culture they travel over situation that doesn't mean that they're they're not reliable so she, again with let's say the concept of democracy mm. what is democracy well if you want to say that democracy is universal adult suffrage in in a place then america wasn't a democracy until 1920 yeah. So what happens to Greek democracy? So you have to, as a social scientist, you have to understand that concepts need to be able to map onto the data. Yeah. Not that it's not like a checklist of if it doesn't do one, two, and three, it's not this. Like, no, that's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. <laughs> that's what makes it fun. <laughs> yes. And interesting because then it's constantly having to adapt. It's not rigorous. It's not rigorous in that it's not trapped in. I mean, water is going to be water is going to be water. Right. But. You know, in my lifetime, I never thought I would see gay marriage. I have, you know, gay friends that in the 90s, it just like never occurred to me that they could ever get married because they never had been. And, and also I was, grew up in a farm town and didn't really have a lot of exposure. But within 20 years, we went from, it, from me at least, basically going, there's no way that this could ever be possible to being like, 
what, when are we going to get these rights? So yeah, I think we have the harder job because we're, we're measuring a moving target. That's right. Uh, but even in terms of this particular topic, right? So, so what is atheism or what is religion? I mean, you know, you could spend your whole life trying to narrow down what religion is and you would never going to get everyone to agree on this. Uh, mm -hmm. and so purely by virtue of that fact, if nothing else, because atheism being defined in terms of non-religion, right? You have to first set out what religion is and that's, you know, good luck with that, right? If, if your aim is to get something that's precise and uh, nobody can disagree on, it, it isn't going to happen, right? So no. we have to make sure what we can. Yeah, the definitions have to be conceptually clear and consistent, but they have to be flexible enough to adapt to the data that you're looking at. Absolutely, yeah. Well, thank you so much for that talk. <laughs> and I hope people who need to hear that hear that. All right, so <laughs> let's go over your article, which I guess we should say um, it does mention Atheism Plus because it was written sort of 2013, 2014. And we won't really talk, I don't think, so much about that because I think that Atheism Plus has sort of had its movement moment. But there's a lot of other stuff in the article that's really great. So do you mind if I just to my viewers read the abstract out really quick? Okay. You know what, I can actually even do this, I'll be all fancy and technical, and uh, I will do this as a screen share. I'm getting really good at this now. I, I use it to share my polling data when I analyze stuff. Can you see the, the screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yours up? Okay, so, the abstract from Divided We Stand, the politics of the atheist movement in the United States. The United States is one of the most religious countries in the Western world, yet a notable feature of the past decade has been the growth in a self-conscious, politically active atheist movement. Academic analysis of this topic, however, remains limited. This article addresses this lacuna by examining the political dimensions of the U.S. atheist movement across a number of themes, including its organizational structure and composition, as well as its goals, strategies, and directions. Deploying insights drawn from social movement theory, it shows that the development of the movement has been shaped by a number of factors which have facilitated growth, but which have also led to a series of internal tensions and schisms that could threaten its ability to exert political influence. Great. That should stop sharing now. Can you see me again? We're back. Yay! All right. Techno pro. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the, the state of atheist identifying uh, identifiers in the US versus Europe to kind of set up a little bit about maybe your perspective coming to this, putting the US in, uh, loc locating it within wider sort of the Western developed world. Mm, okay. Um, the United States is a bit of an, um, an outlier, it's a bit of an oddity in terms of uh, religion and atheism. Um, it's an oddity because it, it, in terms of traditional secularization theory it shouldn't happen um, in terms of being so religious. And there was a poll which um, came out a, a couple of years back, I think it was, that showed that the United States, people in the United States who were religious um, regarded their religiosity with, in, with the same degree of intensity as people in Iran. So it's a highly, oh. I know, it's a highly religious society. And yet at the same time, it's highly developed, technologically advanced, um, highly modern. And so according to traditional secularization theory, these two things shouldn't go together because as society develops and modernizes and so on and so forth. But I mean, this isn't, this perspective has changed now. The theory has, has moved on, you know, referencing what we just said a few minutes ago. Um, but the original theory was, this was how it went and human society progressed and religion would decline and would invariably disappear. Clearly it hasn't happened, particularly in the case of the United States. Um, and so it's, it's odd and it's unusual for that for that reason. It's, it's weird as well because um, it's also where you get the strongest atheist movement in terms of being um, most politically active, uh, say, or the most, the thing that's particularly unique, I think, about the American atheist movement is that it conceives of itself or is increasingly conceiving of itself as a movement, as a particular uh, political um, group um, almost like and, and a lot of atheists who are in the movement will, will sort of describe it as this too um almost like a kind of civil rights movement or the feminist movement or you know whatever it is right and so there's this sense of atheist identity that's growing in the united states that you don't get i mean so i'm obviously from the uk and feel a bit like an outsider when i look at the american atheist um side of things but it's more interesting than what's going on over here because over here it's no big deal, really, if you're an atheist. In fact, in some circles where I work in academia, it's just sort of taken for granted that that's how it's going to be. And, and so atheists don't have to um, be as politically active or, you know, be as organized and be as those kinds of things to try and achieve what they, what they want to achieve. 
So the United States is weird in, in both of those um, particular ways, I think, but again, it makes it interesting to look at. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, that's great. Um, and I appreciate that, you know, kind of um, the both sides of it. Uh, that's uh, a really interesting way to look at it. The extremes are the weirdness is in both the religiosity and the Absolutely. atheist activity yeah. as well. So uh, we talked a little bit before about the state of research into atheists and atheism. So in terms of this article, why did you feel, well, first, what is social movement theory? And why did you think it was appropriate for anal analyzing this, you know, the US atheist movement? Okay, so Social movement theory is, is really about um, the way in which um, relatively disparate groups who have uh, shared similar common overlapping interests in certain areas can come together, operating usually outside the formal political system to try and achieve their uh, common objectives. Um, so again, you know, similar to the civil rights movement, okay, um, the, the uh, position or the perspective was from a lot of people that they were being shut out by the political system or marginalized by the political system. Their interests weren't being represented. And so pressure and change has to come from outside. So social movement theory really looks at the way in which groups outside the system organize and the conditions under which organization can take place and the conditions under which organization and particular kinds of strategies are able to be successful. So the classic way of looking at this is to say there's certain kinds of criteria that a movement needs to have if it's going to be successful in achieving its aims. So things like, for example, uh, it needs to have access to resources like money or you know, manpower or um, media exposure, for example. It needs to have some kind of access to state institutions, even though it's not necessarily operating within them. So uh, one of the reasons, um, I mean, this is a different subject, but just for, by way of an example, one of the things that normally gets flagged up as to why the US has a Christian right and the UK doesn't is because the UK is a very closed political system, whereas in the US it's, it's federal, it's more kind of bottom up and decentralized. And so religious groups have got different ways they can get into the, into the decision making process. So social movement theory is really looking at all of these things and how they fit together. And it, it seemed to me that it was a useful way to look at the atheist movement precisely because of all these internal discussions within atheism, that it was in fact a movement, that they were trying to conceive of themselves as a movement and asking themselves, and we're speaking particularly about activists and um, people who are involved in it generally, um, as to how exactly they should go about this to achieve their objectives in terms of, um, and one, and one of the, because atheists in the United States have multiple objectives, right? But one of which is just to kind of mainstream and normalize atheism. Um, there's this sort of perspective that atheists are marginalized and disadvantaged and there's this poll that comes out every year which asks americans would you vote for an atheist president and they all say no this is a very terrible thing and so just to kind of normalize it in that way is one of their objectives and so social movement theory looks at all of those things and how those goals can be achieved and would you say that there are any nations in sort of that developed world peer that are where atheism is also going appropriately identified through social movement theory or is it really a u.s you know, is it, are there any movements in Canada, um, Australia that you see, or yeah. is it really? Um, I don't know much about Canada. <laughs> That's fine. Like, you don't um, have to know everything about everything. <laughs> the impression I get um, from looking at this stuff is that it, not really. I mean, there there is some, right? I'm not I'm not sort of saying that in the UK there's no sense of organised atheism, right? Because there is, but it's just it's just not to the same extent. Um, one of the reasons. Interestingly enough, I think, and, and maybe paradoxically, why atheism takes this form in the United States is precisely because the United States is so religious. Atheists in the UK or in Sweden, or maybe in Canada as well, I don't know, um, don't have to organize themselves in this way to, to achieve these goals. And it's because atheists in the United States have such a hard time with things and they're getting such a raw deal, and because the political system is so um, full of religion. I mean, what, what was the statistic until maybe a couple of years ago, two senators in the United States were, had outed themselves as atheists and that was it. Oh, um, that would be, yeah, a lot yeah. actually. And it's only after they got elected, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah, but, but highly unusual. It's, it's just, a, you know, that's the end of your career, essentially, if you, if you say that. Um, and so it's because of that, that atheists have to organize and get, get themselves together in the US. Um, there are other countries um, where atheism is higher than the United States. Um, so places like China, for example, um, what was there? there's, there's one in, in Latin America, I think um, Venezuela, weirdly, has uh, high levels of atheism. Um, mm -hmm. 
I, I know, <laughs> it's just, just it's, it's odd. Um, the United States is, it, that's the reason I think why it's particularly applicable. Thank you so much for illuminating uh, that. And I think it's, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna be asking a lot of questions that make me sound simple, but I'm obviously know some of these topics, some things I don't, so I'm learning and uh, finding it really fascinating. So I'll be giving lots of answers that, that make me sound simple as well. <laughs> <laughs> So I think next in the article, you talk about uh, atheist groups and atheist activism. And I think then we, you move a little bit into the role of identity politics, which I guess kind of builds a little bit on this notion of identifying yourself as an atheist and wanting to come together. Yeah. So it, how can you, for um, the viewers, can, just so that we're clear, your notion of identity politics means what exactly? Um, so identity politics is, is really quite, again, quite closely linked to this idea of social movements. And so it's um, really from the sort of 1950s and 1960s, uh, there were various interests that again were being marginalized and, and not reflected in formal political processes. And so um, started to organize politically along issues of identity, right? So it was uh, black identity or, or, or identity around issues of gender, um, identity around issues of environmental concern, uh, for example, or uh, the peace uh, movement. And so a lot of these things are trying to organize outside of formal politics, but also trying to take the political struggle, as it were, into the terrain of culture and into the private sphere. So this isn't just about trying to get change at the legislative level, trying to get policies made that reflect particular interests. This is about trying to change people's attitudes and beliefs and viewpoints across society as a whole on these particular areas. And so again, I think atheism, and particularly in the United States, fits into that really clearly because there is this sense of what does it mean to be an atheist? What is the sense of atheist identity? How does it work? How do people refer to themselves in this way? So it just seems a, a really good fit from that perspective. Yeah, and what we're seeing now is basically those debates emerging and happening more and more and reaching a wider, I think, audience and more people taking part. Yeah. So so in your article, you identify uh, some objectives that you think unite atheists, and then we'll talk later about the divisions and the schisms. Okay. So one of the things that you identify is uh, the continued, uh, the protection or extension or whatever of the separation of church and state yeah. as part of uh, uh, one of the, the big goals of the movement. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? I don't know yeah. if you want to so, so you're lucky in the United States because you have a separation <laughs> church and state we don't have one in law in law in yeah. law well exactly yeah in law but at least you have recourse to the law mm -hmm. uh so over here it's it's very limited um we don't have that right and uh so in the united states you get all these um campaigns which i sort of find really fascinating to remove for example i mean there are lots of them right but the removal of the ten commandments from courtrooms or from outside courtrooms for instance or uh displays of overt religious symbols on public land or, uh, and, and a lot of those are often very successful because as you say, right, there's, there's a law against this and the constitution is very clear on what these issues are. And so is it the a ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union, they're yes. usually the ones that get involved and these cases go to court and, and they usually win, which is, which is a great thing. Um, there's a couple of areas where, to, from my point of view, just oddly, um, for the same reason, it hasn't worked. So these are things like on the currency, uh, in, in God We Trust, um, which was only brought in in the 1950s, I think, yes. about the height of the Cold War. So this was That's whole right. kind of, it's un-American to be, un, you know, non-religious. Yeah, 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 exactly, because the communists were horrible atheists. Um, and also, is it and the, the, the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, they added under God to the Pledge yeah, as well. exactly. So, so those things, there, there are ongoing campaigns to put an end to those as well, but they've been unsuccessful so far. Um, and so, yeah, there's a, there's a constant vigilance, I think, on the part of atheists in the United States to maintain this Jeffersonian wall of separation. And a lot of religious groups don't seem to understand um, that they're not allowed to do this. <laughs> there are laws against it. And you can't, for example, just refuse to issue marriage licenses to people because, you know, you operate to a higher authority. You know, it doesn't work like that. And so precisely again, because the US is so religious, we have to be constantly vigilant on it. But, you know, at least you have the law on your side. 
Yeah, yeah it is a very litigious. I mean, the U.S. has, I guess, a, a reputation of being a litigious country, anyway. Mm -hmm. But in the on the topic of of separation of state, of church and state, you're right that I think m the m vast majority of atheist activism up until very recently, until the advent of the internet, was in the courts because yeah. that was the only well, it was the most direct route to resolution in favor of what we, you know, the interpretation of the law that has always been held yeah. you know, in terms of keeping it separate. And I do a show on my channel called Face Paul Moments of the Week where I just kind of go through news headlines. And I've ended up having to create a segment called Breaking the Law mm. because every week it's the Freedom From Religion Foundation or the American Humanist Association or the, uh, the ACLU having to go in and, you know, teachers are leading prayers in class. Yeah. They're putting, uh, principals are leading prayers, you know, like, and, and every Every single week, it's Pennsylvania, it's Kentucky, it's Arizona, and all across the country. I had no idea how pervasive these infractions were mm. until I started to cover it. Yeah, and yeah. now, I can't believe how much is going on all the time, but hardly anybody sees it. Mm. Yeah. We're not going to put that over here. <laughs> there, was, there, was one, there was one case a couple of years ago um, which went to court about um, saying prayers before local council meetings. And, and the court case won, uh, and then it was a big outcry, and so the government said, well, we can't have that, so they, they just changed the, the law, and, and now it's back to as it was. So you can't. <laughs> so, That's how it happened. <laughs> Um, so yeah, rather than being, uh, I guess, you know, like a, you know, f feminism didn't have, the women's movement didn't have that, the uh, civil rights movement really didn't have that. So that's kind of a weird thing about the atheist movement that it ten has tended, I think, initially to be quite legalistic or yeah. litigious yeah. in its organization. And then you said that's... Oh, I'm talking about atheism, but then yes. the, the, the identity politics and then trying to bring this into the realm of culture and the private sphere, which is, again, it's a different thing. Which is your second point, which is okay. promote the benefits of atheism. I have it right nice. on my list. Which is, I guess, so, so you're, you would see that as an outgrowth, a uh, direct out, out, outgrowth of the new atheism right. movement. Yeah, whatever that is, which is another thing, again, um, it's a label that, that gets, was initially attached to the new, you know, the new atheists. I mean, you, you, you know who they are, right? Dennett, Hitchens. Oh, yes, yes. But one of the other things there, which is also, I find it quite annoying is when people talk about the new atheists very often, particularly when kind of media clickbait headlines, you know, that's it. It's just, that's the only four new atheists in the whole world. And no, there's a whole bunch of people who, who are involved in this, right? But the label gets used all the time without really thinking about what it means. So what exactly, which is another kind of area of interest that I have, which is what exactly is the new atheism, right? And so if you're going to say there's a thing called new atheism, it presupposes there was an old atheism that is worthy of being conceptualized in this way as a thing, but no one ever explains exactly what that is and how it works and how the two things are different and so on. Um, so that's one particular area that I think is interesting, but one of the, one of the things that I think makes new atheism genuinely new, and there's a whole bunch of debates about this, is precisely because it takes this identity politics on board. And new atheism, is trying to um, take on religion in the domain of culture and the private sphere and to proselytize is the wrong word in this context, but to spread the ideas of atheism, to mainstream it, to convince people that atheism is, is okay and is normal and is you know natural state of affairs and all the rest of it. Um, and so you have, I think with, with new atheism, on the one hand, this modernist idea, which is the kind of enlightenment ideal of rationalization um reason science sorry that was my that was my phone going off in, in, in the no worries, no worries. um yeah all of those things like a commitment to um universal goals of, of rationalism and, and reason and science and so on right on the other hand a postmodern interest in identity politics in using culture as a terrain of political struggle so it's this kind of hybrid between the modernist project and the postmodernist project and that's one of the things that makes it particularly interesting in my view Mm. Great, thank you. And then another thing, oh, we talked about uh, the third point was ensuring legal and civic civic equality. Okay, yeah. Which yeah. is kind of must be a union of both the advocacy and the legal as well, because you have to make the argument that you deserve equality in order to attain it. Mm. Yeah, it's it's again from an outsider perspective, it's it's weird that atheists would be <laughs> discriminated against in this way, but you know it happens. I was looking at some statistics uh, earlier on today, just to make sure I was up to date with the whole thing, right? And there was uh, the latest report by Pew, 
Yeah, the, uh, from 2007 to 2014, right? Yeah, and it came out, I think it was 10 days ago, wasn't it? They released these figures. It now shows that the numbers of non-religious, or the religiously unaffiliated, is not necessarily the same as non-religious, right? It's now up to, what was it, 22, 23%, which is a huge amount of people. Um, and even if only a small percentage of those would be atheists, and again, you're into debates about what is an atheist and do you have to identify yourself formally and all that kind of stuff, right? I mean, still, it's, it's an enormous amount of people in the United States are atheists. And so to exclude them from the normal um, civic rights and, you know, and, and duties and all the rest of it and just general, um, you know, your, your civic inclusion as a citizen is just seems, you know, it's, it's just so odd and beyond the pale to me. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not, and, but again, this is one of the reasons why atheists feel that they have to mobilize politically because they're being denied their rights in these particular areas. Yeah, and your fourth point was increased political influence. You segue so well from your yeah. points. <laughs> so it's like you wrote the paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Sean Fairclough, I think is his name, uh, Attack of the Theocrats, is, is really good. Uh, that's his book, uh, is, is really good on this, looking at the, the kinds of strategies that I mean, he's not talking specifically about atheists, he's talking about the, the secular movement sort of more broadly, but he goes into great detail about the kinds of strategies that atheists and secularists in the United States should be adopting to try and gain increased political influence. And, and these are things like increased political organization, uh, lobbying political rep representatives, maybe establishing political parties, um, organizing to promote particular lines to the media so one of the things that religious groups are very good at is you know we've already referred to this right this whole line of religious freedom being infringed upon and, and so on very kind of easy to understand tropes right that kind of cut through all the, the fluff and so on that you get in in day-to-day -day media discourse right and so one of the things that he was he's quite critical of atheists about and i think he's got a point here is that they tend to be very kind of introverted inward looking very you know scientific and rational and that can come across very often as cold and intellectual and one of the things that touches and moves people is the emotional side of things right and so what religious groups are good at is are presenting stories that resonate with people's emotions and so one of the things that atheists and, and secularists need to do is start to present their case more in this direction rather than this, this straightforward legalistic route. I mean, obviously, you know, you need that too, but to present the argument in a, in a more kind of um, emotionally intuitive way, I think, uh, is, is one of the ways in which it has to be done. And so he's very, I would recommend anyone who's watching who hasn't read that book to go and, and pick up a copy of it because it's very good. One of my favorite YouTubers is a guy named Steve Shives. And I think he does, one of the reasons I like him so much is because he's able to make that turn um, mm. from the intellectual to the emotional and a few months back he had a, a video you know in a larger he had a discussion in a larger video about somebody who had died in dealing with death as an atheist and how do you do it and he spent a, some time reflecting on the people that he's lost in his life and how they have affected his life that they they are forever part of him now because of who they were and what they meant to him and so you know a lot of times talking about death is about the loss and the grief but if we refocus it away from the loss to the, the look at the impact that that person has on my life, the change that they had in me, the change that they had in you, and see that as a continuation of who they were, mm. that this is a way to remember them and embody them so that they're not quite so far away. Mm. And I really appreciated his attempts to reframe the arguments around death um, from sort of like a territory of the afterlife, which atheists don't do very well. <laughs> For obvious reasons, to you know, reframing it entirely to say, let's focus on the life of the person and what their life meant to the lives of others. And so, I think those are the kinds of things that you're talking about. That, and I think that those discussions now, when you get beyond the four horsemen, there are a lot of people at the grassroots level, activists on YouTube or in communities who uh, podcast. A lot of people are doing podcasts, or just the people who are listening, who do respond to that and are kind of hungry for that side of the argument. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of the common and, and, and sort of more stupid criticisms of, of atheism that, you know, atheists lack meaning in their life. You can only have meaning if you ascribe to some kind of supernatural moral code, right? I mean, it's just nonsense, and, you know. And so that's one of the things, obviously, that atheists, it's one, it's one of the parts of the discourse that, that needs to be changed, I think, if, if, if the goals of mainstreaming and so on are going to be going to be achieved. Mm -hmm. There was a really interesting study I just covered in my episode of Facepalm Moments of the Week that came out in a 
journal of some, some kind of cognitive science journal, but it was um, a study, an international study that looked at the impact of altruism, of religions, religiousness on altruism in children. Oh, and yeah. what they found was that, yeah, non-religious household, non-religious children were more yeah. altruistic than their yeah, religious yeah. counterparts. I, I saw that, yeah, yeah. Although again, with referencing just all our earlier stuff, you know, you've got yes. to be wary of drawing generalizations. Right. From, <laughs> yes, and that's one study, it's one data point. Absolutely, yeah. And that there were various things in that study that they didn't control for and so on, which could also explain the results. But, um, but yeah, it, it's one of the common refrains, isn't it, that usually gets made. It, it's, it's religion and morality kind of just belong together, just go together, and, and it's just nonsense, isn't it? Uh, well, I certainly think so. <laughs> So we talked about all of the positive sides, um, but what? Uh, let's going to move over to your headline um, section: divisions and schisms. Yeah. What are the things that are might possibly trip the atheist movement up mm. internally as opposed to externally? You have um, in in your article again uh, debates around atheist identity, and then uh, and then the next thing I have is confrontationalism versus accommodationalism. But if it, if you want to talk about the identity side of it, yeah. and okay. then we will get down to diversity third after that. Okay. I, I just say at, at this particular point as well, because the article is in uh, Journal of Contemporary Religion, but it's, it's probably behind some kind of paywall where you have to subscribe to, to get hold of it. There, there's a similar-ish article in, I think the journal's called Non-Religion and Secularity, which is a free online journal. And, okay, and, the and that's your a version of your article on that second one? It's, it's what, sorry? Is that a second version of your it's, article? Well, it's, um, it's, it's compared. The second one is called Faithless, uh, I think, and, uh, and it's comparing um, the United States and British atheism. So it makes some of the similar points, but obviously the one you're referring to goes into the American side in much more detail. But a lot of the arguments kind of uh, cross over. Um, so that one's there, and it's it's free to download and to have a look at and, and whatever. Great. Afterwards, um, on Facebook, if you send me the link to it, I will yeah. put it in the description box of the video so anyone can go underneath and click okay. on it and have a read. I'll, I'll do that. Um, but on your, back to your, your point, yeah. Yeah, so the, the first one are debates around identity. And this is the whole, so the issue of atheist identity is not settled, right? And atheists are not arguing, that's the wrong word, but sort of debating between themselves to what an atheist identity means and what it looks like and how it works and so on. And so there are lots of internal um, discussions going on about that and there are discussions as to even whether or not it's useful to have an atheist identity so Sam Harris for example is the, the classic one here where he says no we don't even need to call ourselves atheists because you know when we're successful we won't even need these labels and, and so by us calling ourselves atheists we're kind of playing the game of the you know the theocrats and all, and all the rest of it right so we shouldn't even be doing that so there's a whole bunch of debates and you, you mentioned earlier on atheism plus was another attempt to try and create some kind of atheist identity and didn't really work and didn't really catch on in the way that some people thought it would and so there are debates around what it means to be atheist and what atheist identity is and that's one of the things in the pot that's continually being stirred yeah um, underneath the sort of movement you've got these yeah, yeah absolutely and and so the second one was what was the second one confrontation yeah. and accommodation yeah so this is one of the arguments um, or debates that's also taking place is over the issue of strategy and whether or not so the new atheists are typically you know zero tolerance of religion it's 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 bad it's you know and it's worse it's pathological it, it's it's certainly not true it, it's, it's unsigned all those things right and um so we shouldn't tolerate religious views at all and so they have a very kind of uh, confrontational approach to religion where, wherever you come across it and certainly where it tries to infringe upon public life it should be confronted and you know, mocked and ridiculed and demonstrated that, that it's not true and, and all of those things, right? So there is a section of new atheism which takes that particular approach. On the other hand, you've got um, what I call them in, the, in the, the article, the accommodationist side, which, and I guess a lot of them wouldn't describe themselves as new atheists for this reason, right? But they have the view that actually we should work with religious groups on areas of common concern, so things like climate change or, or fundamentalism, so on, right? Um, and we should find areas of sort of common interest between religious and non-religious groups, and we should generally be more tolerant and welcoming and, you know, and kind of interfaith is not the right word here, but kind of going across, <laughs> yeah, going across the boundaries, right? across the divide and trying to bridge these, these gaps, right? And um, yeah, so they both have, sort of their merits, really, I think. Um, 
And I just, you, so I was just, um, really quickly, it seems to me like I'm getting a lot of feedback for some reason, but. Okay. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, the idea of uh, the feminist movement or the civil rights movement, yeah. I think a lot of these have a more radical ring and a more moderate ring. Mm. ring. And yeah. you can't have progress without radicalism, no. but you can't have consensus without the moderates. No. And so I think actually in a civil rights movement, you need the assholes on the end to kind of drive and you make the moderates look really asshole, like the, the moderates look really moderate. <laughs> No, I wouldn't call them assholes, actually. Well, sometimes they're assholes. I mean, like the most radical people, the people yeah. who are willing to say the most like the yeah. outrageous things to cross the lines, to uh, at, you know, chain themselves to the president's the White House fence, to throw yeah. themselves in front of horses. Right. You know, because but nobody's going to negotiate with those people because they're yeah. too far out. But they okay. will negotiate with the moderates. Yeah. Okay. But but Richard Dawkins would be on that kind of that kind of wing, right? Um, if my white side of the fence he's on, might depend on the day. <laughs> yeah, well, P.Z. Myers is another one. I mean, you couldn't call P.Z. Myers an accommodationist, right? No. <laughs> so, um, you know, and I like P.Z. Myers. I like, you know, I read his blog a lot, and I like, I like what he says. Um, so, yeah, but I, you said at the, at the beginning as well, these could be sort of problems for the atheist movement. Uh, but there is an argument to say, actually, these could be the strengths of the movement, for the, for the, also for the reasons you just gave, right? You need both these different streams yeah. Yeah, you need, but you need women, you needed feminist women to be assholes to show yeah, that they're absolutely. Yeah, 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 you need people to step up and say, here I am, and this is my voice, and you should listen yeah. to me. And that's going to rub some people the wrong way, but they're yeah. still important, but they're not necessarily warm and cuddly. <laughs> no, you need people to kick up a fuss. Yes. What's, what's, what's the phrase, you know, you, you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs, right? You need, you need people to, to do that, to get the thing going, absolutely. But, but equally, it's good to have multiple ways in. To the movement so so somebody who's kind of thinking you know maybe ah, i quite like atheism but i'm not quite sure they can find other roots into it and people in the movement that they could relate to or identify with and so that's the strength of the movement um so it's one of the things that i find quite interesting about the the atheist movement is precisely that it's it's very flexible and because it's so diverse right and organizationally diverse there's no you can't join a, a there's no group you can get a card and say, I'm a new atheist now, right? Get your signature on it or whatever. There's, you just can't do it. So there's a whole uh, you know, swathe of groups and organizations that people join for various different reasons. And so um, that makes it very diverse, but also um, quite strong because it can respond quickly and flexibly and it can adapt to situations and issues as they arise, right? So I would definitely see these things as being a strength of, of the movement. Yeah, and then from uh, moving on to that, the, the issue of diversity within the movement itself on issues of, of ethnic background or ethnicity and sex differences. I don't think gender, I think maybe gender identity is less of an issue because it doesn't, um, I, I think that there's, there is obviously, I've, I've seen some bigotry in terms of like LGBT rights, but a little bit less of it. Yeah. So yeah, do you want to approach the really uh, touchy topic of diversity within atheism? <laughs> Yeah, we need more of it. It's, it's not, <laughs> it's not line, right? Yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the, the gender one is, is less of an issue than it was, even, even less than it was maybe two, three years ago. So this is when it kind of first came on the agenda, right, with the whole sort of elevator gate thing. Um, and that was one of the issues that, that kind of kickstarted. Everybody watching this, this video will, will know what that is, right? Um, yes. But that was one of the things that kind of kicked it all off. And, and since then, there's been a, a whole um, push towards and we have a more inclusive approach to gender in the atheist uh, movement. So I think that's probably less of an issue now, although, you know, there is still a big, certainly bigger than it, it should be, section of the atheist movement that are assholes, just use your word, about this particular issue, right? There's a whole bunch of people who will say things like, atheism doesn't, you can't get any kind of morality from atheism, so it's just, I don't believe in God and that's it, right? So we don't need any of this other stuff on top of it, right? Which I would completely disagree with. Um, but they are still there, so there's, it's not a complete consensus around this issue. But the, the gender one is suddenly being, you know, people are aware of it now and they're addressing it. And the, the sort of language of, can you use the word mainstream atheist movement, if, if that makes sense? You know, they're more aware of this, of the, these issues, right? Um, in terms of the, the ethnic uh, diversity of it, there's still a, you know, a long way to go with that. It's still very much uh, a, a white person's club is the way in which it's sometimes described african americans for example the least likeliest ethnic group in america to be atheist um, very very strong religious traditions and culture and so on so there's a lot of work i mean and there are groups of course working in that area to promote it but 
it's still very, very um, not diverse in those areas. And, and it's similar in the, in the UK too, by the way, but just not as prominent as it is in the United States. Yeah, yeah. I, saw some, I did a thing with the bar data, and the religious non-white people was a lot higher than the white British population so okay. that does seem to hold yeah, yeah, and yeah. also with the u.s stuff I, you know i there are a few uh, black atheists on youtube who are making content and talking about their experience and also some african americans who are identifying as atheists or sometimes still closeted making mm -hmm. youtubes about their experiences and i think it's important you know to give them space and to hear the fact that they're a minority within a minority within a minority i mean they're you know they're minority population in a majority christian nation they're they're atheists in the community, especially the African American community, that the, the words of faith make up their everyday life. You know, when you screw up, someone says, you need Jesus, or he's got the devil in him. I mean, that discourse is, surrounds them. Yeah, yeah. And right, so right. to be alienated from their, to be an atheist in the black community, alienates them from their community without necessarily fixing, you know, the problems with the, the racial problems larger in the US. And to see all of the extra burdens that you have to kind of go through to to become to function as a as a black atheist in your, now depending on your family religion and your community, yeah. these are all factors. But as a white person, I certainly didn't have to deal with that. Yeah. And understanding everybody's perspective and what they're bringing to the table, I'm, I'm hoping that that, yeah, you're right, the, the, at least the space for that is opening up more and more so people feel comfortable coming to the table, talking about their experiences so that other people can look at them and go, hey, you know, if this person is doing it, I kind of agree with them, maybe I can do it too. Yeah, and it would certainly be really surprising if, you know, we come back to this in 10 years time and the situation hasn't changed fairly significantly, I would have thought, um, because, you know, it does seem, again, going back to this kind of pew studies, the rise of the nuns just seems to be unstoppable almost, you know, and so uh, within that, obviously, I, I would expect that you would get much more uh, diversity just, just from more people becoming or be, being willing to describe themselves as being non-religious. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And the rise of the internet and information. Uh, and absolutely. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a big one in the whole New Atheist thing generally, right? People can now kind of share information freely and access these different arguments and listen to debates and so on, whereas before the internet, you were kind of just stuck within what you knew in your local community and your family or you know maybe, maybe the library might have a few things yes. but that was that was basically it yeah. right you were stuck yes exactly and uh yeah so that's why it's an exciting time i feel like it is you know uh on the cusp it is the emergence of a new civil rights movement that's very much how i feel about the american atheist experience right now yeah and it's interesting too because you know the more uh, this is kind of back with the internet thing the more um information we get about things it almost seems that sometimes the atheist movement is on could transcend the u.s experience and become almost a kind of international thing so there's cases for example of you know bloggers in in, in bangladesh atheist yes. bloggers being you know hacked to death um bloggers in saudi arabia being whipped um for the for the crime of being atheist right or, or for having the audacity to declare themselves as being atheists so you know it seems that there's a kind of spillover effect from a lot of these things that could affect other parts of the globe as well you know as it should right yeah ideally um hopefully by normalizing it in the west it will force places where blasphemy laws exist to be pushing at the edges Absolutely. or if, if not officially then people in their private lives and as that expands, then hopefully, yeah, the right to the freedom of speech and expression of conscience will rise to, along with it. So what do you think your research tells us about the likely future of the US atheist movement? Um, what do you see in the near term? Yeah, I think it's gonna keep growing, <laughs> as I just said. Um, I think, I can't see any reason why it would, it would stop. Um, I think, and there is, to, to kind of, reference the stuff at the top of this discussion about secularization, you know, the traditional secularization thesis said religion was going to decline and so on. Um, and the United States was a bit of a, an odd one here. So secularization uh, theory since then has kind of been revised a bit. Um, and so it's, it's generally taken now to refer to things like levels of insecurity and, and levels of kind of anxiety in people's lives. And so this is one of the reasons that's used to explain why religion is still high in the United States, because you don't have a welfare state, very insecure, mm -hmm. Um, you know, job market and, and so on, right? And, you know, healthcare and all the rest of it, whereas in, you know, in Western Europe, we have all these things as part of the explanation. Our basic services to basic maintain basic human health. life. That's yeah. right, yeah. Um, and so, I mean, they, they may be reasons why, and also there's a whole 
slab of cultural and historical reasons why religion in the United States, you know, isn't going anywhere anytime soon. But there is this creeping tide of, of non-religion or the religiously unaffiliated that does seem to be getting stronger and stronger. And also what was interesting in the latest Pew findings is they, they found that the religiously unaffiliated were becoming even more secular as they went on. So there, there's a kind of polarization. I, mean, I don't want to kind of go necessarily down the culture wars route, but there's something like that that could be happening in the United States. So I would definitely expect it to keep going. I would expect the atheist proportion of it or just people who are willing to declare themselves as being atheist to keep on rising, particularly as it becomes more normalized. And so um, I think the situation for atheism in the United States is in a, in a strong position. And certainly, which is one of the ironies again of the whole thing, certainly more likely to become more politically savvy and, and, and politically robust than they are in, in Western Europe and certainly in the UK where we don't have these pressures. Well, if I have anything to do with it, they certainly will be. <laughs> <coughs> so, um, right. Are there any points that um, we didn't get a chance to talk about that uh, you thought about at the time but would like to bring up now? Lots, but they've all fallen out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> Which happened a lot. So, no, not off the top of my head right now, Kirsty. But would you be willing to come back and maybe in a couple of weeks time, the new year, and talk about your other article on the militant strain analysis of anti-secular discourse in Britain? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, of course I would. Well, then let's make a date. Well, say I'm in touch and try to find something in the spring, maybe the reading work of reading week of spring term. that will be useful. Um, yeah, reading weeks are, are always good. This is really, I've really enjoyed this talk a lot and it's That'll been be really good. informative. Yeah, it's been very interesting. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, well, thanks for being on. So if you hang on, I'm going to stop the broadcast after I give my little outro, and then we can chat a little bit about getting me get the details for your faithless article that people can see. Okay. So thank you uh, so much, uh, Stephen Cattell, for Dr. Stephen Cattell from Warwick University for taking the time to be with us. And for um, everybody else who's been watching, I've been Christy. You've been awesome. We'll see you guys next time. Just to let you know, I have plans to make another video about patriarchy, evidence that patriarchy is a real thing. And I'm going to look at biblical patriarchy and the norms for men in biblical, biblical patriarchy. I hope to record that over the weekend. And this is going to be your Friday video as opposed to politics or patriarchy. It's going to be a but the other videos will be coming up. So thanks for watching all the way to the end, you guys, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.